And welcome back, AP Calc AP students. Mr. Record here from Avon High School, and we are now officially on the home stretch. Now, I always tell that to my students whenever we begin this topic 8.9, the DISC method, because the last four sections of the AB curriculum, 8.9 through 8.12, all revolve, no pun intended, around the ability to find the volume of a solid by revolving that particular shape around a particular axis. And that's exactly what we're going to start talking about in this video. Example one is going to illustrate our very first DISC method. So I'm using the notes that I've assembled for my students at Avon High School. You're uh, able to grab those off the comment section if you would like to, and you can follow right along. So what is this thing called the DISC method? Well, it says we've already known that we could find the volumes of solids using these cross sections. That's the previous two topics uh, content. That's typically 8.7 and 8.8. .8. Now, that's not the only way that you can find volumes. And in this particular case, we're going to take on just a little bit of a different approach. But before, I just want to get some practice in understanding what a revolution would look like. So if you take a look at this left picture, I have a rectangle that has a width of W, and we'll call this a height of capital R of X. Well, if we were going to take this particular rectangle and spin it around this horizontal axis, well, think about what that would look like. It's going to be awfully hard to draw. I'm going to give it a shot here. But you would essentially have a reflection of that rectangle down below, but it would spin out in such a way, and I guess, you know, don't laugh here, but it would spin out in such a way that it would create this sort of disc-like shape. Right? If you can picture a disk coming out towards you and then behind your computer screen to complete a full-on cylindrical shape. Now, maybe my picture over here that's done for me electronically does that a little bit more justice. And that's exactly what we're talking about when we say disk. Now, you might look at that disk and say, well, wait a minute. I, I know what that thing's called. That's, that's not a disk. That's, that's what we call a cylinder. You're exactly right. We're going to refer to a disc as being a really thin cylinder. If you happen to have a quarter nickel dime or penny nearby, that's a really good example of a cylinder that's got a really thin height to it, a really small W value. And that's where this all begins. And the reason is because we have a very handy formula that we can use that will compute the volume of a cylinder. And it happens to be right here. Now, maybe you don't uh, remember it, and that's perfectly okay. A lot of times these geometric formulas are easy to forget when you don't use them very often. And you would never have to know this formula on the AP calculus exam. But that pi r squared times h is going to serve as the basis to build our new integration formula. So what does this all look like when we put it together? Well. You have two different ways that you can revolve a shape around an axis. You can do so with a horizontal axis, which I would have to say is probably going to be the more common of the two. Or you could, of course, revolve around a vertical axis. Let's take a look at the horizontal axis first. And in this particular case, the horizontal axis that we're talking about is going to be the x-axis. So we have this function that we're going to call r of x. And that may not be quite apparent right now. I'm going to point that out here in just a little bit because it seems like, well, how can the function be r of x and the height of that rectangle be r of x? Well, that's the whole point, isn't it? Any kind of height along this region is just going to be depicted by that function. And so typically I would have my students shade in this, this region here. So we're talking about the region that's bounded by r of x and the x-axis in this case. And then if we take that particular yellow region and revolve it around the x-axis, again, I'm not an artist, nor will I ever claim to be one, but you're actually going to see these cylindrical shapes take form all the way throughout this picture. Now, if you've ever been to like a party store Maybe you've seen those decorations that you can 
sort of unfold. They're made out of tissue paper. Sometimes they're called honeycomb decorations. And you kind of fold them around themselves and they create these funky shapes like a bell or um, it could be something along the lines of a witch's hat for Halloween. That's a very good model to kind of depict what it is that's going on here. And we would actually be able to find the volume of this three-dimensional shape. How do we do that? Well, we would just simply take our good friend pi r squared h, that would be the volume of our cylinder, and we would add a bunch of those together because they're stacked on top of each other or side by side in this case, and you would have the pi radius squared, because that's exactly what this r of x is going to serve as, the radius, and the dx is also known as the delta x, which is also known as the w, right? Remember good old w from up here, which, okay, I guess that would be the h of the cylinder. Wow, that's a lot of different things. But that's really what's going on. dx, delta x, w, and h, they're all one and the same. And you are essentially just integrating your formula for the volume of a cylinder, which adds up infinitely many of them, just like we added up infinitely many uh, areas of rectangles, right? To get area, we're going to do the same thing with volumes of cylinders. And of course, the pi can come out in front because he's a constant. And your boundaries of integration, kind of hidden in the picture, but here they are, A and B. They would certainly be X values. Now, there is another kind of revolution called the vertical revolution, which has a bit of a difference in that everything is going to be in terms of Y. I think that's pretty clear to see. And your boundaries of integration are going to lie along the y-axis. Now, we're going to take care of that kind of a volume in one of our future examples. But without further ado, let's take a look at our example one. It says to find the volume of the solid formed by revolving the region bounded by the graphs of f of x equal the square root of sine x and the x-axis about the x-axis. And they kind of give us a hint that the x is going to lie between 0 and pi. Using the graph of f of x, let's shade that region that's being rotated and draw a representative rectangle. Well, we've got our graph already done for us, which is very nice because I, I don't know about you, but I would probably have a hard time sketching a graph of the square root of sine of x, especially without a calculator. Interestingly enough, it looks quite a bit like the graph of sine of x. And that's kind of an interesting little side project that you can do on your graphing calculator is to sketch both of them on the same coordinate plane and compare them. It might kind of surprise you what's happening, but not something that's needed for the solution for this problem. Now, it did say that the x-axis is going to serve as another boundary. So I could sketch the x-axis, or at least part of the x-axis that lies in my region that I'm finding uh, my volume for. And then that will allow me to go ahead and color this in. It wants me to shade this region. And so that is going to be the two-dimensional shape that's going to be revolved around the x-axis and create our three-dimensional shape. I oftentimes advocate to students to take whatever axis of rotation, axis of revolution, and draw a dashed line. Now I'm kind of cheating how I'm drawing the dashed line just slightly underneath the x-axis so I can kind of see it better. And then I draw the swoosh, right? Hopefully it's okay for me to say swoosh. Sorry, Nike, if it's not. Don't sue me. I don't have any money anyway. But that will be our swoosh, so to speak, that kind of depicts where we're revolving. And it does ask us to draw in this representative rectangle. And I want to talk about this guy because the representative rectangle isn't going to seem so important right now, but trust me, as you move deeper into these topics, into 8.11, 8.12, this rectangle that you're going to draw might be the thing that bails you out of a jam. Now, the rectangle is always going to start from the axis of revolution, and it's just going to move through your shaded region, in this case, up to the curve. Now, I could have put this rectangle anywhere that I wanted to. Right? If I decided that, oh, I could have put it over here or here or here, 
that would have been perfectly fine. It makes no difference where you draw it. It's just going to serve as a nice little reference point that this indeed is the R of X. The height of that rectangle is going to be your radius once it's revolved around and you're making the cylinder. It's the radius of your cylinder. With that, there's nothing left to do but to set up the problem. So we know that our formula goes volume equals pi. I'm just going to rewrite the original formula. I always suggest to students around uh, that I work with to do the same. And as soon as you feel like you've got the formula memorized, I think you've now earned the right to not have to write it in your setup. On an AP exam, you would not have to write that as your first step. You could get right into it. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to get right into this, and we're going to integrate, multiply by pi. R of x, well, the length of this would just really be the equation of the curve. Now, technically, it's the equation of the curve that's on top minus the equation of the curve that's on bottom. Now, that might seem, again, kind of silly. Like, why would I write the square root of sine of x, which is the equation for the curve on top, and subtract zero. Well, I'd like you just to go with me for just a moment. I know that that minus zero is not going to have any impact on the problem. But again, later on, when we see these shapes, these shaded regions, no longer sort of attaching themselves to an axis, it can get a little bit trickier as to figuring out what the length of that representative rectangle is. So if you can start by thinking top minus bottom now, it's going to make things a little bit easier later on. And then I've got my differential dx. And then, of course, my boundaries of integration kind of were given in the problem, but they would be the x values at which my shaded region begins and ends, 0 to pi. Now. You might have been wondering all along, like, why is there a square root over the sine of x? Well, it seems like that's a silly function to analyze. Well, there's a very good reason. Had that square root not been around the sine of x, we wouldn't have been able to integrate this very easily. Now, I do have videos in my YouTube channel that show you how to integrate sine squared, but that's something that you typically don't encounter until a Calc 2 or a Calc BC course. So once we take this square and apply it to this square root, you can see very quickly that we're just going to have a sine of x. Now, again, I have my pi out in front, my 0 to pi boundaries, and now I just have good old sine of x here, which is going to be a lot easier to integrate. So we'll do just that now. The pi is going to come out in front. Integration of sine is going to be negative cosine. Now, be careful about that, right? When you integrate a trig word and the answer starts with the letter C, you're going to need to put a negative in front, which kind of looks a little scary because are we going to get a negative answer for this? I, I hope not because volume should never be negative, just like areas should never be negative. So let's kind of hang with this and see what happens. Uh, I'm going to elect to bring out the negative with the pi. That way I don't have to mess with them anymore might make things a little bit easier. And then I can just plug in my pi for x. I'm using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I have cosine of pi minus, and now I'm going to plug in the 0 for the x, cosine of 0. And when the dust all settles here, I would have negative pi quantity. Cosine of pi, that would be negative 1. Minus the cosine of 0 is positive 1. And lo and behold, once we go ahead and simplify all of this, we would get positive 2 pi. So about 6.28-ish uh, if we were to round that. There is no need to put units on this. They would be in cubic something or another. But typically, if you don't have units to begin with, you don't have to provide units. Now, before I end the video, I want to show you a really neat website that you can go to to really get a better look at what these shapes look like. And it's a very neat website called Shodor. It's an interactive math website. And I have both a link in the description of the video and you can see there on the screen if you want to type all that out. But it's the function revolution activity that I think is really neat. So I want you to remember this answer was 2 pi. And let's all head over to Shodor.
Here we are in the Shodor Interactive and the Function Revolution activity. Shodor, not to be confused with one of the characters from Game of Thrones, right? Hodor, is that right? This is Shodor. Okay, so one of the first things you're going to notice when you get here is that they have a default pair of graphs. Uh, I think there are a couple of sine curves here. And you're going to go ahead and you're going to uh, delete those. And I'm going to explain here in a little bit why there are two functions. We are not going to need both of these for the problem that we're going to do. Our function, if you recall, was the square root of sine of x. So to type that into Shodor, you'd have to use SQRT. Now, there's a list of commands that you can Google search that will help you with what you would have to enter to do certain things in Shodor. But by and large, they're pretty intuitive. And the sine of x uh, would look something like this. All right. Now, if we were to sketch this right now, we probably wouldn't be real happy because if you look at our viewing window, our viewing window isn't very, I guess, indicative of what we really need to be looking at as far as our problem. And this is where Shorter is a little bit picky with this particular function. If you try to go zero to pi, which is what our function is going to be graphed on. It's not going to like that. It's going to give you this pop-up that says, Shodor says your function must be defined with your integration limits. Please re-enter your function and or your limits. Well, I found out after a lot of trial and error, the pr program is having a difficult time at the very edges of that graph. It's not saying that there are vertical tangent lines or derivatives that aren't necessarily defined, but it's just struggling. So what I'm going to suggest, if that ever happens to you, is go maybe a tenth or so beyond each of those values. So I'll add a tenth to the zero, and then I'm going to subtract one tenth, 0.1 or 0 0.1, from the pi. And then when I set the functions, you'll notice that the graph is seemingly okay with that. Now you'll also notice that this scale is awfully huge for this little graph that we have. So you can go up here to set the window. And typically I'll just pick something that allows me to get a little bit more insight. I don't even have to worry about going in uh, terms of pi here. I'll just pick something that I know is gonna work well. I could even choose to change the scale according to my likings. And once I do that, you can get a little bit better picture there. And notice that our graph doesn't quite go all the way to zero like we wanted it to, but this is at least gonna give you a little bit of insight into what the shape looks like. Again, for 95% of the other problems that you might wanna plug into this to see what the graph looks like, they work perfectly well with the actual boundaries that you're given. So what's ready? What's uh, next here? Well, we're into the revolution part. And it says that by default, we're going to revolve this around y equals zero, which happens to be the x-axis. Oh, isn't it nice to say that the line y equals zero is the x-axis? No, oh, thanks, thanks for that. I, I wouldn't have known that. And so now we just hit the revolve button and watch the magic happen. There it is. And you could even set the speed. And what's very cool, my favorite part, is you can click on this and you can hold down your left mouse button and you can really see the graph in all of its three dimensions. And this is a really neat experience for you guys because if you go on to take Calculus 3 at the college level, you're going to be working a lot with three-dimensional shapes and we'll use programs like Shodor or others to really get a good depiction of those shapes. And another cool thing in the statistics box, it will give you that volume. Now, granted, this 6.251 isn't exactly, it isn't exactly the volume that we discovered, 6.28 2 pi, but remember we had to chop this a little short because of the limitations of Shodor. But as I said before, in most all other functions, you're going to be spot on. All right, that takes care of this. I'm just going to keep spinning this graph around. I, I love this. Uh, and, and until next time, we'll see you. We'll see you. Keep studying your calculus.